All right, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. We're working on a new system today. This is the Zoom system. Welcome to today's Southern Fire Exchange webinar. My name is David Godwin, and I'm the coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange with the University of Florida. Today, we are excited to have our guest speaker, Kevin Hires, wildland fire scientist with the Tall Timbers Research Station. Kevin will be giving a presentation today related to his recent publication that argues against precise habitat and fire management recommendations for the southeastern U.S. It's now my pleasure to introduce Kevin Hires. Kevin is a wildland fire scientist with Tall Timbers Research Station and the director of the newly formed Pre Prescribed Fire Science Consortium based at Tall Timbers. Kevin has worked in the prescribed fire science arena for nearly 20 years and has published over 50 peer-reviewed publications. In addition, Kevin has extensive experience as a prescribed fire practitioner and manager, having been the fire program lead for Eglin Air Force Base, where he oversaw a burn program that regularly burned over 100,000 acres per year and responded to over 100 wildfires per year. Kevin lives in Thomasville, Georgia with his wife, Stephanie, and their two kids. So welcome, Kevin. We're excited to have you with us today. Thanks, everybody who's joined us. And just one moment as you go ahead and pull up your slides. Thanks, David. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. And do we have the uh, shared screen working properly? Yep, I can see it. Fantastic. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, this promises to be a, a fun talk. When we, um, when we wrote the initial paper, uh, it was somewhat controversial, but I, I don't know that, that when you really think about precisionism and the search for specificity, that it really is all that controversial. It's really a matter of, of precise language and coming to understanding, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do a little bit of that throughout today. Before I start, I do want to acknowledge uh, this extensive help that I've received from uh, Dr. Joe O'Brien, uh, uh, Dr. Lita Kobziar, and John McGuire on some of the slides and input. And as David mentioned, if you'd like to keep a pretty dynamic chat going uh, during the talk. If I see it, I'll try to address any questions as we move along. But I've also asked those uh, individuals to help make my talk a little more precise by providing some interpretation of, uh, of data if I misspeak or if I leave something a little vague. So uh, feel free to have that dynamic chat going in the background. Um, also feel free to argue with me. And that's part of the point of this paper. It was, um, the paper itself was a, opinion piece and we know what uh, you know opinions are like and so um, it really is meant to spur discussion and as we apply the concept of precisionism and the search for specificity to southern fire science it's really important to understand a little bit of context about science um, as we know science and research it's structured learning but it comes with a heavy dose of skepticism and so we should think about what people say and do it professionally and argue in order to find truth and what works for you know us and our land especially as it relates to land management because science seeks generality but it collects data in a context at a place and so oftentimes results from research can extend beyond the domain of inference from the data that and the site where in which they're collected and the relevance of conservation science over the last 20 years has increasingly been measured in how is your science applicable to management? And so you've seen a, a dramatic rise in the literature of management recommendations made by non-managers to managers uh, from, you know, from data collected at one site to another. And that's how we try to to find uh, you know, applications for research results. But because many scientists aren't managers, sometimes things get lost in translation. And we'll have a, an opportunity to discuss that. This, uh, this topic of precisionism uh, was you know, described by myself and uh, Steve Jackson, among other authors, in a paper that we published last year in Trends in Ecology and Evolution. Again, it was an opinion piece based on a trend we thought we were seeing in conservation where inappropriately and oftentimes unjustifiable management prescriptions were being given to folks and they were leading to negative conservation outcomes, i.e. working against ostensibly what we were managing for in conservation. We also noticed that such specific recommendations were being incorporated into policy scale planning, you know, at a high level. Um, and you know, with the with the impact of trying to homogenize ecosystems by focusing people 
on optimal conditions everywhere we have a particular species or a particular restoration objective. And so that, that policy level precisionism is a missed place or misguided specificity that ends up homogenizing landscapes. And then finally, the uh, problem of over extrapolation of site specific data from one research project to others has also led to confusion among managers and, and a lot of conflicting objectives. As Kevin Robertson, one of my colleagues here says, science, especially ecosystem science is all contextual and we'll have that theme and we'll kind of discuss that throughout the talk. Um, this is an image, it's not of fire, it's of streams. And I just wanted to bring that up that this problem is not fire specific, although precisionism does have quite a bit of, of fire applications. These are pictures of stream restoration projects that have the exact same redesigned sinuosity across the country. Of course, there's variability among these different ecosystems and different landforms, and yet we're designing, we're engineering a level of specificity that does not take into account the natural variation needed on the landscape. So as we apply this concept of precisionism to fire, we're going to look at it in relation to the, the growing body of literature and management recommendations around natural fire. And, you know, this is going to appear to be a talk that is against, I think it's going to appear to be against fire in certain seasons. In fact, if you take that home, that's the wrong message. And I want to be clear about this. This is a talk about variation and not restricting variability based on a misunderstanding of what is natural. And so we're going to discuss the precision problem with natural fire in three parts. One, uh, look at the fuzzy past. And I, th I think the facts about you know, natural fire regimes and even reference conditions often are overstated and come with some unsafe assumptions. And we'll discuss what those are. We're going to then apply uh, precisionism to the complex present um, where we manage, I think, uh, with an overly precise understanding. If we manage with an overly precise understanding of what natural fire is, it limits our options can waste some money and compromise biodiversity. And we'll go through some examples of that. And I encourage you to, to think of your own or even challenge my examples as needed. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about the uncertain future and the constraints of managed fire regimes in the future and, and, and how they demand more options for us managers, fire managers, not fewer, and how precisionism can work against that as we prepare for rapid uh, ecological change in the next 100 years. And before I move on, I do want to call out um, this paper in, recently published in Conservation Biology um, by Freeman et al. Uh, it's one, one that uh, Lita Kobziar is on, and it's a fantastic application of some of these ideas uh, to historical fire regimes, and we borrowed from this paper as portions of this talk here. But it's best to think about why we're all here. We're here because of biodiversity and conservation in the Southeast. We have many different objectives represented on the phone. We've got many different objectives represented by our agencies or private uh, entities that we work with or for. But biodiversity in the Southeast is, is something that, all, it, that, that we are about in all of our agencies in various ways. And of course, species richness and rarity is, is something that, that we come back to over and over again here in the Southeast. And many of our imperiled species simply, uh, you know, are found here, nowhere else, and they, were, and they are sustained by frequent fire. And a recent paper in uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, described just how far into the sixth mass extinction of, uh, you know, that we've documented on planet Earth. It's a lot worse than you expect. And when we think about the sixth mass extinction in the context of, of global change, it really is, it brings home the need to have, you know, a, a robust discussion about conservation and what, you know, what techniques, methods, and pathways get us to biodiversity conservation. And so this is why we're all here. And I want us to all keep that in mind too, as we debate some of the topics. Of course, ecosystem restoration and, and management has always well, has developed a, an intense focus on the past. And this is largely uh, captured in the, the variety of literature on historical ranges of variability and historical fire regimes, which rely on natural processes to guide managers. Um, several of us have published in this literature before and tried to apply these concepts to the landscapes. And it relies on disturbances such as fire 
that, that they had predictable patterns of intensity, frequency, scale, and that ecosystems can absorb and recover and, uh, and, and respond to these natural patterns of disturbances, but that human activities have altered the patterns and threatened those ecosystems' integrity. Um, the way that we have to look at the past is often accomplished through reference sites uh, and targets as targets for restoration. And those reference sites are key windows into the past. I encourage you to pick up uh, the White and Walker paper as a really robust treatment of the, the opportunities and pitfalls of reference site selection. But these reference sites approximate the variability of the past or are supposed to, and they're supposed to substitute for natural processes but they're often expert driven and we'll discuss some of those pitfalls as well. Historical fire, fire regimes and fire management have now been codified as part of the, uh, the fire management at, at state and federal policies across the country. Uh, and in fact, throughout the world. If you look here, the fire regime condition class adopted in 2002, essentially identifies ecological departure between current and historical reference conditions to, prior, to prioritize treatments for land, uh, prioritize fire treatments across the land. And in a survey in 2013, 64% of managers utilized the fire regime condition class to try to characterize landscapes in the Western United States to guide fire management. So this focus on the past is deeply ingrained now into the way we approach uh, fire objectives and fire management. Um, the degree to which the world actually buys um, into a very specific understanding historical fire regimes and their management is actually quite different. And I encourage these papers if you want to find out what other approaches they, they take. And then lastly, uh, Hayward et al. 2012 is a fantastic chapter that starts to detail many of the challenges that exist when we take historic ranges of variability and try to apply those concepts of historic fire regimes to a current landscape. Here in the Southeast, our historical fire regimes are pretty well documented in several senses. First, we know that they were frequent. And this paper by uh, Mike Stambaugh, 2011, is frequently cited as, as you know, capturing a lot of variability, although there's, there's a number of other citations we could have listed here, and we'll get to those in a bit as well. But this frequency is really what defines our historical fire regimes. Uh, Mike found a two-year fire return interval in tree ring data, but the range was phenomenal, including some documented one-year return intervals and as few as 12. Now, there are some caveats to, to tree ring data that we'll talk about in a bit, but one of the things that he also found was that fire in a historical context was seasonally variable. And in addition to, to sort of scientific or, or uh, you know, uh, research approaches to historical fire regimes in the Southeast, we have a bevy of cultural literature as well. Wallenberg in his Longleaf Pine Tome from 1946 says, there's a 12 month fire season in the South. Inman Eldridge, who was the very first uh, forest supervisor at the Choctahatchee National Forest, writes to uh, Gifford Pinchot almost in despair, when he says that, you know, essentially we can't put out the fires. It's only by chance that any area of unenclosed land escapes burning at least once in two years. And he goes on to list all the reasons why we, why people were burning. And he says, and if it didn't burn, lightning cleaned it up. Lastly, 75% of the pinelands in Florida were estimated to have been burned annually by Baker in 1926. This frequency is well documented. Increasingly, we're getting more and more data and more and more refined uh, insights into this historic and historical fire regime. I listed a, a number of dendrochronological papers and, uh, and theses here and that are providing us windows into this near past. These historical fire data are among the most detail, detailed records we have, but limitations absolutely exist in how we apply these to management. First, we can't assign an ignition cause, but we often, uh, we often try to uh, through correlation and timing of the year. And often we, we think of these historical fire regimes as natural fire regimes, but we can't currently do that with these dendrochronological records because they overlap wholly with, uh, within a landscape of, of human influence from pre-settlement to, to present. Furthermore, we know that we can't record all fire scars in all stands, particularly here in the Southeast. And interpreting uh, fire return inter intervals can be, I think, seen as a, as a conservative return interval. In fact, this high frequency, the fact that we capture that, 
and, and it may be even higher is pretty, pretty astounding. And of course, extrapolating seasonal patterns of growth from the present to the, to the long-term past becomes more and more difficult as you grab more and more climatic variability over the last four and 500 years, including the Little Ice Ages or major droughts that were found in the 1660s and 1770s across the eastern and southeastern United States. And then how do we interpret human influence and incorporate variation in scarring into our, uh, our understanding of these historic records is something that's absolutely open to interpretation and, and part of the science of dendrochronology. But one of the things that strikes me most when I read the literature is how the imprecise language of some of our understandings of historic fire regime can confuse interpretation for management applications. And one study found 40% of fires in Mississippi occurred during the dormant season. If you dig into the reference, they define the dormant season as the months of January and February. And they borrow some data that, that was collected from Florida to do that interpretation. Well, those data show that 40% of all fires in Mississippi occurred in two months. And yet the conclusion was that you know, if you want to mimic an historical fire regime burning the growing season. Well, if you define the growing season as 10 months in the Southeast, I'm fine with that. But it brings in an imprecise language about what is dormant. Well, maybe the diameter growth in a longleaf pine is constrained to 10 months of the year, although it's probably quite variable year to year. But if you're looking at, you know, palmetto or evergreen shrubs, what is their dormancy? And, and really understanding all of these, these terms has, has caused a lot of confusion and consternation and management objectives and recommendations here in the Southeast. So let's, let's look at that precision or imprecision of language that we use when we talk about fire regimes here in the Southeast. Lightning season fire is proposed as this natural fire season because the late transitional uh, period from spring to summer in, you know, in Florida, particularly central Florida, corresponds to hot, dry weather, drought, and early onset of, uh, of summertime thunderstorms. This lightning season fire is asserted to be the evolutionary driver, but it's often confused with growing season fire. When, they, when we confuse these two things, we, we end up having very imprecise management objectives. What is the growing season? If you think about what your agency or what you as an individual land manager define as growing season, it's often arbitrary. At Eglin, we debated whether it was March 1st or March 15th. Other organizations declare, you know, the, the first day of spring, March 22nd or whatever that is. And, you know, when you think about how arbitrary growing season is and you have an aberrant year like 19 or like 2017, where we had trees candling the 6th of January in Thomasville, Georgia. What does growing mean relative to your burn objectives? It certainly doesn't mean lightning season. When you get further and further south into the peninsular Florida, growing season versus wet season versus dry season, you get a subtropical pattern rather than the sort of temperate frontal driven pattern of winter, winter rainfall. And the current tropical climatic gradient matters a lot for how you might apply recommendations of fire regime to your specific properties and your management objectives. And this idea of growing versus dormant, the further south you go is a false dichotomy and dry versus wet becomes very important. And we'll explore that in some detail as well. And then finally, historical versus natural fire regimes. Historical fire regimes, as I mentioned, you know, dendrochronological data, um, you know, written records, anthropological records, these are scientific-based estimates of variation. And these historical regimes that come from data are really valuable windows into the past. And, and something that is, you, you know, something that is, that I find both incredibly interesting, but also, um, you know, confusing because many people try to interpret those as natural fire regimes in the context of, uh, of what we should be managing for. And that's something that we'll have to address. Why am I all about this natural thing? Why am I having a go at natural management? It's, per, it's, most, it's most important to understand that natural is poorly defined and diffuse. It's a val value laden term and, and it defines humans outside of ecosystems in many cases. If you, and we'll look at some of the circularity of the logic of natural fire, but 
it is open to what experts say it is. And one expert may have a very different opinion as to what they see. And if you look at this picture, which I borrowed from Chadwick Avery some years ago, or if you look at the dot in the center, are the nodes of this graphic, are they white or dark? Well, it depends on what you want to see and where you look as to what natural means to you and when you absolutely would declare something natural. And we'll explore why that's just not a helpful tool and term when we're thinking about current land management. Okay, so we've, with all that background said, let's dive into precisionism as it applies to natural fire by examining some of the assumptions that have been laid out for natural fire regimes in, in, in the Southeast. First, the case for natural fire is built on five assumptions. First, that climate stability is, you know, is something that, that existed in Florida over evolutionary time and maintained species via lightning season fires. Climate stability, such as what we have today, the current climate was present many, many years in the past in Florida and preserved a, a stable evolutionary environment. The season for lightning is summer and has been over evolutionary time is a second assumption that comes along with climate stability. Third is that species evolved to this regime over millions of years, that it took a long time of this kind of fire to create the evolutionary patterns that species uh, have in response to disturbance, natural disturbance. Fourth, Native Americans were simply not here long enough to alter these evolutionary trajectories. And even if they were, we assume that lightning strikes always dominated those ignitions and that Native, Native American ignitions couldn't have mattered at a landscape scale. So let's dive into those assumptions. This paper by Grimm et al. in 2006 is really cited as one of the most quintessential papers for climate stability. What I want you to do is don't worry about all the data, go read the paper and make up your own mind. But I want to point out these amazing oscillations. Here where my cursor is, is a 60,000 year change of domination by you know, pollen type observed in one lake in central Florida. You've got amazing oscillations between pine and oak domination across these peaks that are caused by major uh, ice flows that came off the, the Laurentide Glacier around the northeastern United States called Heinrich events. And each time one of these major ice flows intersected the, uh, the North Atlantic, it stopped the Gulf Stream in its tracks. And you have these dramatic shifts within a few, sometimes hundreds of years that, that dominate by, or are dominated by pines or versus dominated by oak. So if you're oak dominated and you're burning in central, central the United States, what's, what's the fire season for, these, for oak in, uh, in that, that part of the country? It's certainly not the summer. But beyond that, you know, the assertion is made in the paper that because we have similar amounts of pollen here as we do out here, that those could be, could be analogous communities. When in reality, there's quite a bit of debate in the community and among uh, Dr. Grime himself as to whether or not that could be true. And the reason that it's very important and very, very up to interpretation is that this ambrosia pattern here, the column of ambrosia dominance, really changes dramatically over time and indicates some, some extraordinarily cold temperatures here in, uh, you know, in central Florida that simply are not analogous to anything in the present. Uh, those ambrosia, the grass, and the quercus, the, the oak-dominated phases, also according to, to this paper and others, represent novel assemblages. So even if pines were similar, we have a, a dramatically different assemblage that dominated more than half of the time over the last 60,000 years. So the assumption of stability is, is not only not, you know, not just questionable, it's, it's documented to be unstable. And if you're thinking about evolution with this kind of variability, in, in community change over a relatively short period of time, variability may have been an evolutionary advantage. And I think that's a theme that we're gonna carry forward in the next portions of this talk. Um, but getting past the one paper published from, from Lake Tulane, when we look at other papers that, that document Pleistocene climatology, Jackson et al, 2000, Watts et al um, uh, in 1992, we, un we see that Florida was unbelievably dynamic 
particularly North Florida, where we have the best pollen records. The extensive areas of peninsular Florida, Jackson writes, and the continental interior had vegetation unmatched by any modern pollen samples when they looked at a 20, at the, uh, at, uh, the, the last glacial maximum around 21,000 years ago. And so if you look at this spatial map, you can see not only is the Gulf much smaller because sea level was lower, but here are where the novel climates, no modern analog climates existed, and no, no modern analog pollen formations exist. So if variability was the norm over the Pleistocene, let's look at species adaptation and a term called exaptation. When we think about fire adaptation and we look at, at, at species response, we have to separate out whether or not a, a species response is adapted to fire or whether it was a fire adaptive trait, one that, that simply was there and could benefit from fire. There's a wonderful paper called Fire as a Global Herbivore, and herbivory and fire have a lot of remarkable uh, similarities as disturbance regimes. We end up with a lot of just so stories in conservation that, uh, that really dominate and, and appeal to our, our sense of how to communicate science, but that don't represent testable hypotheses. It's very difficult to assess evolutionary significant, significance. But one of the things we absolutely do know, and I want to point out these two hotspots of biodiversity in the southeast. One hotspot of biodiversity here in the, the Pine Rocklands around Miami-Dade and, uh, and the Florida Keys, the other in the Florida Panhandle. One of the things that we know about plant diversity in particular is that through mutation and polyploidy, plants can evolve quite quickly and, and become reproductively distinct entities almost overnight. And there's a number of citations so you can look to see how this happens. But neoendomism in the Pine Rocklands of South Florida, this hot spot of biodiversity is something that, that Joe Bryan, I should, my apologies, that should be his thesis in 1997, is, is a phenomena that is absolute and documented. Key endemic species are less than 100,000 years old. That's the age of the rock in which they inhabit uh, this, this incredible gradient, pine rocklands. And neo-endemics dominate the flora of pine rocklands in, uh, in, in South Florida. And they have a very interesting fire regime and fire response, as we'll see. And so it is unsafe to assume that species take millions of years to evolve. In fact, one of our best examples shows that they, they happen very quickly. And if we uh, agree with Beckett et al. in 2005 that the, you know, the historical fire regime, those one that we want, follows those species uh, that show the strongest and most positive response, let's look at, at adaptations across a variety of species. Wiregrass is often thought of as historically and naturally the, the sort of quintessential evidence of species adaptation to summer fire. Wiregrass blooms best and almost only produces the seed in, the, in that May-June time frame. There's a little bit of variability around that. There's a little bit of variability season to season, but it is, it is amazingly tight in its response to growing season, lightning season fire, excuse me. And, and wiregrass is a dominant ground cover in, in, you know, in much of, you know, South, South Georgia, North Florida, and parts of the, the Southeast. These fire adaptations uh, that we often cite is that it's got a folded leaf with high surface area volume ratio. The reproduction response that we see down here uh, after lightning season fires, that rapid re-sprouting following fire, and it's extraordinarily fl uh, flammable as we all know when you burn it. But when you think about wiregrass, I can spin another yarn, and I'm not saying this is true, I'm just saying it's plausible, and when we think about adaptations and evolution, you have to understand we all are guessing to some degree. But that wiregrass is a, also has characteristics that are amazingly tied to potential grazers and grazing adaptations. And why is this important? The dominant fauna of the Southeast over the last 100, uh, 100 to 500,000 years were unbelievable grazers and, uh, and, and dynamic fauna that don't exist today. But if you look at grazing and dispersal adaptations of wiregrass, it's got extraordinarily poor palatability except immediately after fire. It's, it's a weak three on that doesn't auger its seed into the ground very well, but that may have been quite good at capturing fur because it's such a short distance dispersal without some sort of, um, of animal transport. It doesn't reproduce without a trigger, which is interesting. From an evolutionary perspective, 
you don't just say, hey, you know what? There was a lightning season fire. I better bloom in the lightning season and take advantage of it. The fact that plants choose not to reproduce, choose, and scare quotes here, is, is significant. What is the cost to reproduction outside of a lightning season fire? The fact that it doesn't reproduce is really fascinating because then it, it suggests some other evolutionary drivers that cost it fitness. And that's a very important point when you think about how to interpret evolution in these uh, species specific responses. Moving along though, we look at plant reproductive response as evidence of, of natural fire. And, um, and one of the things that, that we've documented quite well and, and Bill's work among others, you know, absolutely shows increased synchrony and uh, increased flower output following uh, fires across the growing season, not just the lightning season. And we, he's hypothesized and others have that, that this leads to greater pollination rates and niche and establishes a niche for seedlings to uh, to to you know germinate and, and establish themselves. Well, we tested this hypothesis because the evolution of plant pollinator interactions is actually something that we can at least look at in the present day. And we use legumes as a test in my thesis uh, back in the, the late '90s. Significant part of the Florida are legumes, uh, the, the, the flora are legumes. They include a number of endemics and legumes have a really important ecosystem function, but they've got very specific pollination syndromes that are largely tied to bees in the uh, most papillionoid legumes. When we, ex when we expose these to fires in different seasons, lightning season treatments, non-lightning season treatments, and no burn uh, check plots, what we found is a very diverse set of evolutionary responses in terms of its flowering, uh, legume flowering abundance and, and reproduction. First of all, lightning season, there were two species out of our suite that, uh, that responded best to the lightning season burn treatment. We had three species that responded best to the non-lightning season burn uh, treatment. We had uh, two species that showed no difference. And one of the interesting things, and I think that this goes under recognized, although many of the, uh, the current, much of the current work on butterflies is starting to point this out, some species require fire-free intervals. And this, uh, this is a really terrible photograph of a uh, uh, herbarium specimen of Petalosma malbinum, which has now changed names and it's hard to keep up with. Uh, but Petalosma malbinum benefited only when it wasn't burned, in years that it was not burned. And in fact, it has a, a very tight uh, pollination syndrome with a small moth that appears next to the flowers in years of, of no fire. And so really interesting part of the variability in this, in this, uh, this particular regime. And of course, there were no differences uh, amongst these four. And so this is amazing test of, of the evolutionary significance and variability, but we also looked at pollination syndromes and found that neither season compromised the ability of, of legumes to, get, to be pollinated by the, the bee, specific bees that, that, that were required uh, in these cases to, uh, to, to affect pollination and set seed. As a fascinating test of the evolutionary significance and, uh, and bee work really does argue that variability is an adaptation in these plants. They are, they are robust to changes in, uh, in season of burn and changes in flowering synchrony and timing with respect to their pollinators. But let's, dump, let's jump further south and look at Camacristi kiensis, which is an endangered plant um, down in the Keys. And uh, Liu et al. report that this is a fascinating uh, fire regime that, that they recommend is diverse, including a wide range of fire seasons critical to maintaining the diversity of this particular plant because it has such an interesting response to season of burn. And uh, they actually conclude that potentially dry season fires, which appear to be important to this plant, you know, which also they assume are anthropogenic, were, uh, were critical to the evolution and phen phenology of uh, Camacristi kiensis. But let's, let's not just focus on plants. What about the animals? Recent publication uh, earlier this year shows that the first definitive bison herds arrived in North America about 135 years ago, and they quickly diversified genetically. What this is showing is that, you know, these quintessential American animals are relatively newcomers to the landscape. And the quick diversific diversification genetically is evidence that, that when, ar when arriving, you know, Evolution doesn't take a long period of time. 
They've also docu documented a second wave of bison around 30,000 years ago, which rapidly colonized North America. And so, and this is what gave rise to, uh, to our bison herds that we think of on the prairies. What's really fascinating is in 30,000 years, bison wallows now have become a critical component of biodiversity maintenance in tall grass prairie ecosystems. And so if you think about species assemblages, adaptation, and communities, this is a rag to species richness story where you have an invasive species from Asia arriving 30,000 years ago, becoming a keystone species in just a few thousand years. Uh, you know, that's something to be celebrated. And I do want to point out that those, those dates are going to become significant here in a minute. Now let's, uh, turn, let's turn to the next assumption of natural fire and indigenous peoples. The old paradigm that exists is that Clovis cultures were the first peoples in North America. They arrived 12 and a half to 13,000 years ago, spread very quickly across both North and uh, South America, and that that represented the, uh, the first peoples that, uh, that, that colonized and, and also represented the downfall of, uh, of Pleistocene megafauna. Natural fire enthusiasts often downplay the uh, significance of these indigenous influences on fire regimes because they say they weren't here long enough to affect evolution. Species, like we just discussed, they think have evolved long before, and that humans couldn't have preempted lightning. Let's, ass let's, uh, let's quickly look at those assumptions. First of all, what is now the new paradigm is that Clovis Pre-Clovis humans have been here at least 15 to 30,000 years ago. We have hard evidence of butchered Macedons just in Osceola, in Osceola River, about 20 miles from where I'm sitting, uh, under 20 feet of water from a, a definitive 14,500 date. The reason that that is significant is that that means those individuals crossed a different land bridge than the Clovis peoples. Recent genetic data of Native American mitochondrial DNA shows that they probably have been here and certainly been separated from, from uh, those in Asia for about 30,000 years. Imagine the 30,000 years. Is it coincidence that buffalo arrived over a land bridge about the same time, second wave of buffalo, along with these genetic data? Coincidence? I think not. But more controversial, but equally as, as interesting, is that recent data from San Diego shows that Homo sapien may not have been the first arrival on the North American continent. They found evidence of a butchered mastodon, but it couldn't have been Homo sapien there, so they're they're suggesting a different species of of, hum, of Homo has arrived in North America around 130,000 years ago. Again, following the same time frame as uh, as other Pleistocene megafauna migration around that that period of time over land bridges. And so the fact that we now know that they're pre-Clovis people opens up a window much larger uh, for humans to have driven or at least participated in, in community assembly or species evolution, which does not take millions of years, but rather can be quite fast. And of course, there's ample evidence for human use of fire. And uh, I, I'd simply throw up one review there, but, but John McGuire and others can, can provide many, uh, many additional um, examples. You know, the idea that somehow anthropogenic fire regimes or first peoples could have obscured natural fire is, it, it seems sort of just counterintuitive. What point did human fire become unnatural? Let's review the last assumption that even if they were here a long period of time, that they could not, that, that human, humans can't preempt lightning. Here's some examples from Eglin uh, fire data from the last 20 years. And we often think of, of, lightning fires in terms of means. Look at the monthly means. Here are a number of, of all lightning strikes across Eglin by month, clear peak in the summer. As I told you, this is not an anti-summer fire, not an anti-lightning season fire. It's a, it's a, it's a talk about vi uh, variability. When you start looking at lightning fires relative to all humid ignitions, which include prescribed fires at Eglin because we set them, as well as wildfires, they pale in comparison. Uh, you know, to a, a landscape that's dominated by, by people. But what you also see is that lightning fires tend to follow really, really uh, deep drought years. And when we started examining even closer the variability, where do those lightning fires occur? What we find is that only 2% of all documented lightning fires at Eglin occur in roughs that are two years or, uh, or less. And so most of these fires are occurring in heavier roughs. In fact, um, more than 50% of those occur in, in roughs that are greater than 10 years old. So deep, heavy fuel loads 
just like Edmund Eldridge said, tended to get cleaned up by lightning. However, humans are able to preempt uh, wildfire from almost any source when the rough is less than two years. And this is actually supported by some of the evidence that Rob Addington and others published in 2015 from Fort Benning on wildfire occurrence. And so it doesn't, it doesn't take many managers to know if we burned up the fuels ahead of time, it ain't gonna burn again quite as well or as often uh, in the first couple of years. All right, folks, we're gonna move along pretty quickly now from a, a treatment of the fuzzy past and looking at how we interpret historical ranges of variability through uh, the other tool we have, which is reference site selection. Uh, we tend to come up with a variety of very specific reference uh, recommendations from reference sites that, we, that we've selected across Southeast, but two to three year fire rotation in the lightning season is almost always among those recommendations. Generally, the conditions extant uh, during pre-Columbian colonization has been the target, which brings up whether or not, you know, what, what role those, those Native American burns had uh, in maintaining that but we're reliant a lot on stand age and structure. And we focus a lot on hardwood density when thinking about what reference targets and benchmarks to achieve for restoration. Um, the the over specificity that we discuss in some of the uh, the, the paper in Tr Trends in Ecology and Evolution uh, is specific to red cockaded woodpecker management. But goals for pine and oak species density that have evolved over time with that recovery plan revisions are um, are unbelievably specific and, and eliminate some of the best quality old growth sites that we have like Greenwoods, um, Big Woods as actual uh, optimal foraging habitat for the red cockaded woodpecker. It simply carries too much basal area. And lastly, there's few sites left in the southeast that experts agree on that are truly reference. And yet the ones that we love were all protected by human and anthropogenic burning largely outside the lightning season uh, on quail plantations uh, that were burning in February and March or those set year round by military ordinance on, uh, on some of our, our highest quality uh, uh, portions of military reservations. But we see where the natural bias and ecosystem restoration pops out in these reference site selections. And who defines the reference site? Well, it's often expert driven. What if there are no reference sites available or we have limited variability? We only have a couple that we can rely on. How do we measure ecological change as, a, as we're restoring ecosystems back to some sort of putative reference condition? And then are our managed disturbance regimes actually changing reference sites as we continue to manage for recovery of, uh, of degraded sites? And that begs the question, what if reference sites simply aren't static? And recent paper that, uh, that we published uh, from Eglin Air Force Base absolutely shows both expert bias. The red dots in this picture, and I apologize if anybody's colorblind, I, I truly can't change this graphic at this point. The, um, the red dots are defined by this ellipse, the gray ellipse. They were expert driven uh, reference sites that we sampled for the species richness and abundance in the understory. What we found was that there are a number of other ecosystems that we that when we also sampled them fell within the range of variability of reference and yet were not included in reference site detection by experts. So when you look at data, you can see that we restrict what uh, experts claim or reference. And it's largely because we tend to overestimate structure or overestimate the value of, of structure when determining it, uh, our reference sites. And we underestimate the value of the actual diversity that's there and how it is um, uh, ranged on the landscape. This is another kind of complex graphic, so I'm gonna walk you through it, but it's important. In 1994, a large scale landscape scale experiment was undertaken to look at recovery of fire excluded sand hill habitats at Eglin. This big ellipse here represents reference conditions, a range of reference conditions defined by understory, midstory, and overstory of unequivocal reference sites that were expert driven. And these were, these were the uh, recovery sites that we were going to monitor after we burned, cut, and herbicided hardwoods out of. And you can see that they were all outside the reference conditions to begin with in 1994. We must have been a good job of, of, of selecting our reference stands. Well, over time, what you'll see is that over the next 15 years, our reference conditions actually changed with almost as much magnitude as many of our recovering uh, stands. And so these reference conditions are not just dynamic, but they're changing in really substantive ways. So now that we've got two time points, 
is the reference condition represented by the overlap of all of this uh, species space or the conditions represented by both ellipses or is reference now just the new condition? These are really important and difficult questions to answer and, uh, and certainly not something that we're gonna you know, address fully here, but begs very important questions about how we measure ref, you know, restoration and how important variation is uh, in the reference sites we choose. Here's a very similar pattern from uh, uh, Lita Kobziar uh, from Mayaka River State Park. Here's the reference condition they wanted over time, over a 10-year period of time. Here's how it moved. Well, the restoration sites moved, certainly moved past the original reference, but still haven't quite achieved. And yet, the one that's, that's the closest uh, in, in, in recovery distance is the winter burn, winter chop. And so it begs a lot of questions about yeah, how we measure restoration success and what is the role of these reference sites in, uh, in, in assessing uh, in our ability to achieve. And that brings us to one of the graphics in, in the last paper and transitions us almost uh, to the complex present. Red cockade woodpecker um, are an amazing example of why uh, optimal conditions are actually hindering our opportunity to, to, to grow woodpecker populations. In, uh, in the optimal benchmark condition defined by a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, recovery plan, we sampled all of the, uh, the stands at, at Eglin uh, that overlapped our ecological monitoring plots. These are, and this little red triangle represents the, the optimal condition identified for red kite woodpecker. The big ellipse represents the entire range of site conditions in which they, they occupy. Now, there's a variety of arguments to be made, but this is a very restricted optimal condition. Clearly at Eglin, the opportunity to grow woodpeckers extends way beyond what we think of as reference or restricted and uh, in a legal sense. And of course, over the, the development of the recovery plan, Eglin got an exemption so that we could carry lower basal area uh, of longleaf pine more oaks uh, in order to, to, to not be counted against our recovery standards. But Eglin, and kudos to those managers, has the largest, fastest grow population, is 100 breeding pairs beyond the recovery goal, and yet has most of their occupied habitat outside of putative optimal conditions. And this is, this is really fascinating because of what it means for uh, our ability to manage variability. If we think about turning all of this landscape, which is clearly good red cockade woodpecker habitat and maybe providing some ancillary benefits, umbrella type benefits to Sherman fox squirrel. But if we manage just for the, the optimal condition, we may actually lose habitat variation that, that sustains other species. And that is um, the end of the retrospective and the beginning of our assessment of how precisionism uh, interacts with the complex present. So how does natural fire help us manage our current landscapes? We are experiencing a chronic shortage of prescribed fire capacity. We simply do not burn enough. Managers have to choose daily, and this is gonna sound dramatic, but it's true, between competing objectives, which may also expose them to personal and professional liability. Even if natural fire was dominated by lightning, and I certainly believe that lightning season fire was a wonderful and, uh, and dynamic part of the variability of the historic fire regime. It now has a much fire and natural fire has a much different and unnatural context in which we manage. Not only that, it costs us conservation. One, this is a stand, a picture that I took. Uh, natural lightning season fire was recommended because the stand had too many oaks. Because we were focused so much on structure and reference structure, and lightning season fire was the uh, was going to be the tool to restore it, restore this stand structure. A hot summer fire in a stand that uh, that that hadn't been burned in 30 years was not going to it obviously did not help our red cockaded woodpecker recovery efforts. Right. In fact, it set back our goals. Um, and in fact, it didn't even kill the hardwoods. They just resprouted and it then didn't have any overstory competition. And so there are conservation costs. And the reason that we've experienced some of these is that the path back or to recovery is not the same path that, 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 that used to exist, right? And so in these ecosystems that haven't been burned a lot over the last hundred years, the accumulation of the duff layer has been one of the subtle and yet really critical uh, you know, pieces of, of ecosystem development that has gone unnoticed and led us to, uh, to burn under conditions that, that actually killed stands and, and set back our red cockaded woodpecker management objectives. Duff 
uh, rep and consumption has been the, the the topic of a variety of of research projects and really represents one of our big step forwards in understanding how to burn by safe prescriptions. And so in the complex present, we're dealt with a variety of conditions that may not have ever rep ever been represented over the historic past or not uh, intersecting the uh, the constraints that we have in the present. And when we look at this particular graphic, this dotted line is a safe burning threshold over which we documented unequivocally, at least with data, uh, that you could burn on top of the duff without smoldering uh, around the base of trees and killing them. And if you think about uh, documenting a safe prescription window, natural fire, you know, there's some summer burning days where you could do it safely. This happens to coincide with the hurricane impact, but there's also winter days that are absolutely critical because when what you do see is that over, you know, a 12 month period, there are about seven opportunities to burn a stand. And if you have a large portion of your landscape that is out of whack, that has duff and it has not had a good fire regime, if you want to maintain that overstory, then these burn days are really valuable and you have to be willing to burn by prescription any time of year. Now this slide is, is, is something that I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on, but please feel free to dive in and read the paper and some of the appendices that we suggested uh, um, for reading. But the conservation costs of burning by natural instead of burning by objective are starting to mount. Local RCW extirpation has been seen in Pocosin habitats, in shortleaf habitats, outside the longleaf pine belt, because we try to treat those areas as though they were longleaf pine. We cut oaks out from under them and for a variety of reasons that's not necessarily the stand structure that the red cockaded woodpecker needs in a place like Kentucky or North Carolina Pocosin. And so the variability in the RCW's habitat selection and sustainment in these marginal habitats is actually a really interesting opportunity for its conservation. But when we constrain um, our understanding of its habitat variability and its its ability to to, to live in those habitats, we actually can can reduce our ability to um, to to grow and 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 recover populations outside of the the optimal conditions. Uh, I estimate DoD over the last uh, 20 years has spent nearly 10 million dollars in herbicides, reducing hardwoods on xeric sites for red cockaded woodpecker uh, rather than using fire alone. And uh, and I think that we've got plenty of data to suggest that oaks are not as important as uh, as as we might have once thought in in in, in reducing. Uh, habitat use by red cockaded woodpecker. That's 10 million bucks that we could have spent on a variety of other things that may have, including more prescribed burning, that may have uh, enhanced habitats elsewhere. And of course, we went through uh, some of the old growth forest remnants uh, where we've killed kill fires by not burning by objective, but rather burning by lightning season, thinking that the natural season was going to return something to a natural state. And here is a, here's a new and emerging um, uh, conservation cost and uh, and the Florida grasshopper sparrow in central Florida has has experienced precipitous declines in its population and it's largely due to lightning season fire at a landscape scale being applied without a significant understanding of what the habitat needs of the bird are. It appears now that February fires are actually critical in providing sufficient nesting for the Florida grasshopper sparrow because it allows grasses to grow sufficiently high to protect the nests as we, uh, you know, about the time of the onset of the rainy season. And so understanding why you're burning is much more important because here is a critically threatened uh, species uh, with declining populations and we're actually killing it by not understanding exactly what it needs or by just focusing in on natural disturbance as opposed to uh, a managed disturbance regime that meets the objectives of recovering or sustaining that particular species. Um, in this complex present, managers are faced with competing objectives. If you're managing for timber and red cockaded woodpecker, if you're managing for multiple species that may have different seasonal uh, uh, phenological responses to fire, it's really important for managers to have the flexibility to burn year round and to accomplish a variety of obje objectives that often don't align perfectly with a particular single day of burn. And uh, we've, we've documented these uh, competing objectives with respect to Sermon's fox squirrel and oak reduction in longleaf pine stands. But more and more, the metapopulation dynamics of some of the rare, um, rare butterflies and other uh, insect species uh, in, in embedded in these longleaf pine and, uh, and southern pine ecosystems represent a, a really 
a big conundrum for fire managers. Um, if you read the paper, we described the Mustang Corner Fire in the Everglades, which was a prescribed fire that was held up in lawsuits because there were competing endangered species um, groups that wanted to see fires of different sizes. Well, they delayed. Two months later, a wildfire comes through, burns the entire thing. I think there was local extirpation of, uh, of one of the, uh, the butterfly species. And and represents an you know just a stark example of how these competing populations uh, or competing uh, uh, objectives within burn units and and small and, uh, and and exposed individual taxa are to uh, to large scale fire in, in any season. And of course, the interactions of other altered disturbance regimes change the seasonal fire effects that we might expect from our putative natural fire season. Uh, hardwood hammocks that are burning inside the Everglades with, quote, lightning season fires, uh, they burn because the hydrology has been altered. And so if you want to preserve the biodiversity that's represented in some of those hardwood hammocks, you need to burn under conditions in which they won't consume, which is now dictated largely by managed hydrology. So let's play one more uh, sort of mind game and say, what are the impacts if we only burn in a natural season. Well, clearly there's less fire. There is more inter interference with Clean Air Act non-attainment conflicts. There's increased conflict with fire suppression activities like we saw this spring. If you were waiting for a May burn day, you might've gotten caught up in, um, in burn bans in Florida or Georgia while we fought fire in the Okefenokee. And of course there's sea breeze and smoke management concerns that are specific to any individual unit. And prescription windows are already uh, decre are decreasing with increasing temperatures and the commensurate declines in our age. And let me say that natural fire, this cuts both, both ways. If you're going to reduce any, artificially reduce any burn window seasonally uh, for no reason at all, we're going to have these, these kinds of, uh, of impacts where you push managers into, into smaller and smaller windows and start to compromise their ability to balance some of these competing objectives. Here's just a very quick picture of a, of a burn unit, Highway 98, you know, the town of Florosa. Uh, if you have residual fire and, and, and smoldering uh, materials at night, if you burn this in the, uh, in the growing season, are you going to have a land breeze that, in, that impacts and settles smoke on this major highway as, uh, as winds shift? Um, you know, the sea breeze may give you the best opportunity early in the spring to burn this unit with a consistent south wind. Um, all of those things have to have to come into play, but they come into play by objective, right? We don't burn by season. Season's an opportunity. It's not an objective. And most burns or landscapes have many objectives that ensure the variable application of fire over time. And, you know, again, I want to emphasize, although I don't like the term natural fire. I've probably burned more in the growing season, the lightning season, whatever season and whatever term we want to put on than, than many folks. And I love the fire effects when I'm trying to meet specific objectives. And um, if this debate were going the other way, and a precision certainly cuts the other way, when recent policies of one proposed Southern state artificially limit burn season by capping the maximum temperature of burns to 70 degrees or limit burn size, you know, that, that is anathema to me as well. We already have too few windows. We need to be thinking about science that identifies more opportunity, not restricts to less. One more practical consideration, and, and this relates to prescriptions and legal documents with artificial precision. We all burn under prescriptions. We use, um, a, you know, a, a suite of tools to estimate smoke impacts and to estimate fire behavior. Many of those tools themselves are overly precise and are not effective in, uh, in allowing managers a window into the kinds of expected fire behavior they can, they can uh, burn under in order to achieve objectives. Uh, one common tool uh, used, Behave, returns flame lengths in tenth, tenth of a foot intervals, 4.5, 4.6 foot flame lengths. It's simply over precise. And when people use that, in a, when they add that imprecision, rather than saying, well, four or five or six, then it adds a false sense of security that we know that this tool is able to provide some insight into, uh, into our uh, management constraints. But if that's not bad enough, something's worse on the horizon. You know, the food fight over what was is actually, I, I maintain, counterproductive to conservation. I think what was is highly variable, but the expected climate change that we uh, that we want that we think we're going to see is going to challenge biodiversity in existential ways. 
we're going to look in that sea level rise. There was an actual competing talk that I'm glad you're not on, but I think it was going to be interesting um, that looked at human migration from coastal areas inland and what that was going to cost communities and forest cover um, as we expect coastal communities to, uh, to lose population as sea level rises. Increasing constraints on fire and increasing exotic species invasions and pathogens cause, are going to cause novel conditions and compromise our ability to manage what, what may even be native communities today. Very quickly, here's a map of changes, increases in, uh, in uh, warmer temperatures, particularly driven by nighttime lows. They're not getting as low as they used to. And this paper by Mike Osland uh, shows that uh, with respect to, to, to migrating uh, mangroves and coastal areas, but these growth zones, these changes in plant hardiness zones are showing that already we're seeing more plants capable of growing further and further north than they ever have. We are in a no analog, uh, we're in, in store for a no analog future, and there's some examples of fire dependent ecosystems that, that, that are harbingers of what's potential. Um, this is the Turks and Caicos Islands, um, one of the prettiest places on the planet. It used to be dominated by the Caicos pine, which is a uh, Pinus caribea of our Bahamensis. Joe O'Brien and, and a group of other researchers uh, were asked to come down because a, an exotic scale insect invaded these pine lands on pine rocklands. Looks very similar to what you might find in the Florida Keys or South Florida or the Bahamas. A scale insect killed nearly 95% of all Caicos pines, and because all of the needles fell at once, the next fire burned up all of the regeneration. And so we've got a state change, an alternative, uh, alternative stable state moving to uh, to the um, a scrubby uh, uh, scrub land of, uh, of of hardwoods and and other native species, but quite different from the open pine lands that protect the native biodiversity. We were asked to conduct a prescribed fire in one of the last remaining stands. And um, in addition, if this isn't bad enough that, that an exotic species completely wiped out the overstory on all of those islands, um, they have to contend with sea level rise, which um, it, this is not sea level rise, it just happened to be a wet year that Joe's standing in. But because these pine rocklands rely on a freshwater lens that is very thin. It sort of rests on top. It's more buoyant than the, the salt water. As sea level rises, that's going to change these ecosystems even further. What we're looking at is a relic of past pine lands, and it's disappearing fast right before our eyes. And so, folks, it's time to reassess historical ranges of variation as strict guides for management and restorations. It's time to abandon the term natural management and really fo focus on present and future ranges of variation. It's going to be a different approach. We need to start thinking about quantifying species responses to variability, not to optimality. We need to think of management variation, the, just the natural diversity in the way that Mark Melvin might do something at its way versus uh, Brett Williams at, uh, at Eglin as an opportunity to achieve possible futures rather than some specific return to the past. And then science and managers have to partner in order to monitor these outcomes. You know, one of the criticisms that people levy on, on this no analog future is that, well, if anything goes, where's the conservation imperative? Anything doesn't go. We have to have variation that's monitored and that's quantified through good data and uh, long-term partnerships. The past isn't prologue, but the future, but it can provide lessons for the future. How Heinrich events change climate in the southeast might be an interesting thing to understand if, uh, if parts of the Greenland ice sheet break off in the next, uh, next two dozen years. Variation in species habitat usage provides manag managers with other options for balancing competing objectives. And, man and variation maintains options for future, um, uh, responding to future climate change. And variation, whether it's in season or whether it's intensity or heterogeneity makes for more efficient use of limited resources in the present. This uh, variation in fire regimes and this recommendation for variation and embrace of it for meeting objectives is actually based on data. Pyrodiversity isn't just a good idea based on uh, bet hedging. It's actually recommended based on data, and here are a variety of papers that do so. And, and pyrodiversity is achievable by burning for objective, particularly when you monitor it. So in closing, what does success look like in the future? Hopefully it looks like more prescribed fire. We're monitoring data are key, where we make decisions not based on the, 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 the supposed past, but we make decisions based on how the present is responding. Researchers have to become more mechanistic rather than correlative so that their, their 
research results apply mechanistically across the landscape rather than than um, than than making correlations between uh, what the, what we think happens at one site and what might happen at another. Frequent fire in all seasons has has sustained biodiversity in the past. Our historical uh, data show that, but we have to have lots of robust discussion. And you got to argue with me, and you got to take what I say with your grain of salt and apply it to your site, and then we decide what works. I'll close by saying that we also can start searching for climate resilience in our own data and our own sites. The Wallenberg uh, description of turkey oak as a nurse tree at the Choctahatchee National Forest led, for, uh, led us to think about mid-story as providing uh, microsites, why they would provide microsites for longleaf pine regeneration in these xeric dry sandhills. And this is our shameless plug for Louise's talk uh, next month, but it, it allows us to think about this as a potential climate resilient strategy for hotter, drier conditions. So last and least, I suppose, is that natural fire is, uh, is used in conservation, as used in conservation, really simply is unknowable. And, uh, and I think I've given you some exam examples of how just saying natural and trying to pursue it can compromise conservation objectives. We need to be testing the assumptions about historical fire regimes. Try them on. If they don't work, you know, loosen your grip on the past. And we test that through site-specific monitoring data and we test it in ecological and management site-specific contexts. Generality doesn't work on the specific burn day, right? And I think and I fear we're going to be monitoring the decoupling more and more of historical fire regimes and ecosystem trajectories. And so it's important for us to know what's achievable as ecosystem change accelerates in the next 30 to 40 years. And so I encourage everybody to consider management context and future range of variation and try to find out what enhances ecosystem resilience at multiple scales. And I appreciate it. Um, be happy to answer any questions if folks have it. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin. Once again, if you all joined us during the presentation, my name is David Godwin and I'm the coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange. We just had a really interesting presentation from Kevin Hires, Tall Timbers Research Station arguing for the ecological and management benefits of fire management flexibility. Uh, so at this point, uh, we've, we've gone over our hour, but we, we do have Kevin uh, for some more time. So if you have questions, and, uh, and I know based on how much material he just covered, I'm sure that there are questions and comments aplenty. Uh, if you have time, go ahead and type those questions into the chat window and, uh, and We'll go ahead and field those. And David, uh, for, I will supply. Go ahead, Kevin. A, I will supply a reference list. Um, mm -hmm. The talk itself is going to be posted by David, and um, and I'll go ahead and put the complete reference list together and uh, and and make that available to you also, David. Okay, thanks. So so the, there's a question I think a really important sense uh, or a question about the sense of what fraction of program costs should be allocated to monitoring and research. Um, if a large scale agency wished to adopt the no analog future approach, I, you know, that I think it's, it's a great question and, and one that, that I don't have a great sense uh, of, of an answer for. I think that that is probably dependent upon, um, you know, those managers and the research partners to come up with. But the point is that we need to be committing resources. And, and ironically, it's the first thing to go when budgets are cut or staff are reduced as we, we drop the data acquisition. Um, I think that the uh, there are some uh, cost estimates that Brett Williams or I could provide on what the Eglin program uh, runs, but you know most of the data were collected by firefighters um, with uh, botanical or wildlife supervision. Um, certainly wildlife programs collect a lot of their own species specific data to match with some of those ecosystem level, uh, level change data. But I, I think a lar lot larger budget should be spent but um, I, I am uh, opposed, I think, to some of the really large landscape generic monitoring programs that, that cross regions, uh, such as uh, some of the fire effects monitoring uh, with brown transects, for instance, just don't work here in the southeast for change detection. And another question that came in uh, from Josh, he says, have you found out that any invasive species in certain areas provide a better blockade? when doing prescribed burns. What, what do you mean by blockade? Let's see if we get any, any clarification from Josh. <clears throat> Invasive species are, are pretty interesting. We, we do treat, you know, especially some of the wildlife concerns um, with respect to uh, um, 
the Florida snail kite in the paper um, and, and a few other species. Uh, exotics are, are tough, right? I mean, you know, you, you fight them as much as you can. And then once you lose that battle and they become naturalized, um, I think that, that there is uh, a lot more uh, opportunity to study what are the you know long-term ecosystem wide effects because many of these things are naturalized they're here to stay whether it's the red imported fire ant or you know some of the, the fungal pathogens that we've added or or what have you we had a question come in from kevin robertson he says you say that the past <laughs> should be our guide what should be perhaps it is maintenance of native I, i'm what perhaps it is the maintenance of native biodiversity, but you did not say it explicitly. Are there any other values that should be our guiding light? Yeah, I, I stuck that biodiversity slide in there, but it probably wasn't as as explicit about it. Yes, absolutely. Maintaining as much biodiversity as we can uh, in in light of extraordinary and unprecedented change in the sixth global extinction. I think that that is an imperative is protection as much biodiversity as we can in in light of that. Kevin, you know, Bob Mitchell uh, used to talk about the three R's, uh, richness, rarity, and resilience as being kind of the, 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 you know, guiding light, if you would, of conservation. And, you know, those things, we're going to have to make some tough choices, right, as managers and as, as, as scientists and, and as a conservation community uh, in the future. And I fear, in, in some cases, rarity-weighted focus um, as we see it play out in, in landscapes like the Everglades is starting to actually compromise our ability to manage for anything as we try to fit everything into a, a more and more restricted landscape, if that makes sense. Kind of along those lines, we had a comment uh, came in from MD Trigger. They say, I applaud the very rigorous examination of how we think about natural ecosystems, their typical fire regimes, and the mm. importance of variation. However, we also need to examine our values. Science, no matter how good, can tell us what we should do. It can only inform us of potential effects of activities with respect to our value-based management objectives. The sooner we stop considering largely arbitrary reference <clears throat> conditions for what should be at a site and start thinking about them as what we want and value, the better we will be able to articulate the importance of our work. I uh, agree wholeheartedly. This, in fact, a lot more articulate than I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we, we have Kevin's email address. I see we have some more comments coming in. We'll get to those in just a second. Uh, you can see his email address up there on the screen. And, uh, and, and I'm sure that you, if you have questions uh, or comments for, for Kevin uh, and you'd like to reach out to him directly, uh, yeah. he'd be I, happy to. And, and David, I do want to emphasize again, and, and you know, we, my colleagues here at Tall Timbers have helped me do this, but you know the 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 idea of burning in the lightning season is fantastic. I think that that you know when the when the concept emerged in the '80s that this was an important window that we should be thinking about. It, that it opened up opportunity, and that kind of opening of opportunity is the is the sort of variability that gives managers flexibility, right? You know, at, at Eglin, we didn't stop burning just because we hit some arbitrary date, and uh, and and there are plenty of examples of of southern fire programs that that do hit an arbitrary date. Well, if your prescription says you can't burn on March first because it's typically dry or wet or wherever you're at, and and February twenty eighth you get a bunch of rain. You're, you're, you're out of prescription on March 1st if you have an artificial date. And so I think, I think in the way that growing season fire in the 80s opened up opportunities, natural fire in the 2000s is constraining them a bit. And, and, and so I do want to emphasize how important it is to burn year round for objectives. And I don't want this to be an anti growing season or anti lightning season fire. I want it to be a pro variability talk, right? Those are good points. I think um, for for anyone who who hasn't seen uh, the Kevin's paper from 2016 and Freeman et al. that just came out uh, this this past month, I think 2017. Put the links on there, uh, and and I'm sure if you contact uh, Kevin or the other authors, if you need access to those papers, they'd be happy to share them with you. But those are those are both uh, papers. I encourage you to to sit down to read over lunch. And I, and I think that um, 
they're, they're really great mental exercise for us to, to think about um, some of the perspectives that we have, some of the, um, the, the assumptions that we may have, and, and whether or not after reading those papers or uh, listening to Kevin's talk today, you, you change your assumptions. I think that this kind of uh, conversation and debate is, is really healthy for, for the scientists, for the managers, for the practitioners, and to, to help us to, to move forward because we really are, you know, we're all working towards being uh, better stewards and better managers at the end of the day. And I think this kind of presentation like this and reading those two papers um, uh, offer healthy debate and, and help us to all minimize silo building. So uh, with that, thank you so much for joining us and thank you, especially Kevin, really enjoyed it. Thank you, David. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and, and have a good day.